Hello. Well, look what I found. I have been, I have been um, for the last three days, I have been sort of fighting with the telephone, my telephone service provider. Oh dear, oh dear. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I left my telephone on the bus and uh, that uh, what follows afterwards for the for the for the next three days is a sort of a tragic comedy. I uh, I got off the bus. I realized that I had left my phone there, and uh, all of a sudden, the first you know what you have to do in in theory, but when that happens and you realize that you have, I could see the bus going with my telephone there. So had I had my wits about me at that time I would have perhaps I had been uh, to the supermarket and I was carrying my shopping trolley and another bag and this and that but I thought afterwards that what I should have done was to stop some nice driver and say please can you take me to the next bus stop because my telephone is there but no I or if I was in the center of town to get a taxi and and uh, you know just just go uh, to the next bus stop I didn't think of any of that instead I wasted minutes saying no I couldn't have left it there no so I looked again in my handbag I looked again in my shopping bag anyway a tragic comedy that went on for about two or three days um, eventually I, I got home and I said, okay, let get my, <laughs> let me get my wits about me. What is it that I have to do? The first thing is obviously to inform the uh, telephone company. All right. So I did that and, uh, contradictory information about, uh, whether they would send me another SIM card with my telephone number. Would I have the, uh, the information on the telephone if I used another SIM card. Oh, anyway, <laughs> eventually, I, d I didn't actually call, uh, I didn't actually call lost property because they always, I had lost other things uh, on buses and they always tell you, you have to wait until tomorrow to give time to the bus driver to bring things to the lost property office. So they always tell you to, to call the next day. So that wasn't my, fir my first phone call. So anyway, the next day I telephoned the, uh, I suspended the service and so on, waiting for the next SIM card. The next day at eight o'clock in the morning, I called the lost property office and uh, they asked me to describe the telephone and I described it and then wait a moment and then they came and they said yes we've got it it's, it's here and I said what what yes we've got it here oh my goodness anyway that was the beginning of the um, uh, the, the solution to all my problems but look what I found in this lovely book which is um, how to deal with idiots is a funny book and this is what it says telephone service lines allow us to experience powerlessness very vividly indeed after waiting for ages and going from one prompt to another press one press zero press four press the hash key you get to tell some low-wage, low-security employee about a problem that floors him, either because he's not had the right training or because he is authentically powerless. That's when your humiliation by things, which is in fact a permanent state of being called real life, that is when it turns in on itself and then into anger at being powerless, which is basically a kind of shame. Meanwhile, as the guy on the line tries to sell you a package deal or a special offer, your sincerest desire is to strangle the poor fool with the telephone wire. All in all, like a rabid dog or fox trying to pass on the infection, the phone guy has dug his teeth teeth into you at a place that makes you both makes both of you 
impotent. That's how communication companies, in a show of cruelty that nobody else would dare to give, throw us back into the phenomenon they are supposed to overcome, namely incommunicability. <laughs> Like all PR efforts, these customer service lines are designed not so much to sort your problem as to stifle it until after the next billing cycle. <laughs> okay, so that was uh, <laughs> that was my experience with the telephone company. Anyway, finally everything else everything is sorted out. Let me move on to another point. Uh, there is apparently a new film about nuns, a new film from Hollywood making fun of nuns, making fun of the Eucharist, making fun of all the things that um, Christians, certainly Catholics, considered sacred. I was listening to Dr. Ashenden talk about it, I believe in GB News, I saw it on a YouTube vi video. And uh, <clears throat> and he was saying, you know, enough is enough. I mean, this wouldn't happen with any other religion and so on. And it, 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 it is true, isn't it? And uh, Christianity is being uh, laughed at and uh, reviled and uh, everywhere, it seems, certainly in secular countries, and that is the West, <coughs> which it's 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 kind of a, it, it, it confuses me because <laughs> it looks as if the only country at the moment where Christianity is not under attack is Russia. Can you believe this? How about the third secret of Fatima about uh, what was it about um something to do with the West uh, uh, saving Russia or something like that. Could it be that it is the opposite? <laughs> that it is, after all, Russia that is going to help Christianity at the end? Because we see in Ukraine, is certainly, have you seen the last um, um, Tucker, Tucker Carlson's uh, uh, interview about what is happening in Ukraine and so on? It is true that uh, I, I, I have a video from ooh, about nine months ago when the um, when they started arresting priests and uh, and uh, closing down orthodox churches and so on and with um, icons and relics being sent perhaps sold to museums in the west and, and so on um, so it seems that uh, russia at the moment is not is the only country that is not after Christian, Christianity or Christians. Uh, in any case, I feel very strongly about this. We have seen this this obsession, especially with nuns. How many films from Hollywood, you know, mocking nuns uh, has Hollywood done so far? Quite a few. And of course, we mustn't remember last year when the uh, in the uh, what was it the Los Angeles. Uh, was it the Dodgers or whoever it was, you know, with uh, mocking nuns and mocking the crucifix uh, with uh, men dressed as women and all kinds of sexual insinuations going on. It's really uh, terrifying. And <clears throat> I feel very strongly about it because those of you who have followed me from the beginning, know what my childhood was like. Um, I have uh, talked about certain experiences. I was raised by nuns. And so I always feel that I have to come in some sort of way to defend them because everything I am and everything I have become, uh, I owe to them. And I, I, I feel a sort of a moral obligation. They raised me, the Sisters of Charity, in an orphanage, and uh, I feel a sort of moral obligation to, to, to just say something to defend them. 
I have shared with you several instance, instances about how I was brought up and my relationship there with all of us girls with, with the nuns. Um, I won't go into them, but uh, I, I have uh, talked about several examples. Well, okay, let me just repeat one or two. Um, where they displayed certain knowledge of human nature um, that we don't see anymore in educators. At the age of, uh, for some reason, at the age of 15, they would give us almost free range to to do all kinds of things without necessarily being punished for, for breaking the rules. I remember at one time on purpose I I was late, there were rules, you know, so I was late for uh, the dining room and something and I did it on purpose just to at the age of 15 you just want to stand out I don't know what I was thinking but anyway I decided to be late on purpose and of course I knew I would be punished to instead of going to recreation to go to the classroom and study geography or whatever and so I did it on purpose I came inside the dining room being late everyone was looking at me and I saw the nun coming and I fully expected to, to be told off. Instead she said, um, 15, are you? And I said, yes, I am 15 years old. And she said, yeah, hmm, it shows the silly age. Go on, sit down. And she didn't do anything. <laughs> she didn't, she didn't punish me or anything. She just, they would, we would get at 15, for some reason, they would allow us sort of a, uh, to, to get away with things that we wouldn't be allowed to get away with at 14 or 16. By the, after a few months of that, we actually grew up, as it were. I can see it now that we actually, they exhausted us. We became tired of going against authority and we just, uh, okay, never mind. What happened was that we, we actually grew up. Another example that I also shared with you in previous videos, um, the rule was that, for example, at lunchtime, we would all go in and we couldn't talk during the first, uh, during uh, soup, for example. Um, now, for those of you who wonder why would you, wouldn't you be able to talk, well, it was it was a, a way of teaching young kids discipline. This is the rule. There was nothing special about this soup <laughs> or the first dish. It could have been dessert, but it was a from this time to this time. One is not allowed to talk, and then you can talk. Okay. So the punishment was that since you broke the rules, you would go outside. The, the place, the orphanage was huge. We had plenty of uh, recreation outside, recreation rooms outside and inside. Um, the place was absolutely huge. And um, the punishment was that we would go outside since we broke the rules fine you go outside and then when everyone is done and finished okay then you would come in and have your lunch by yourself and that was it so the punishment was that you would go outside and go round and round and round and round the recreation room until everyone left then you would come in this particular time I don't remember what it was, but I had something very important to say, very important to share with everybody else. Okay, so I decided that I had to say it. I couldn't wait until the second dish. I, I had to say it right now. So I started talking. The nun, I saw the nun coming towards me, and I thought, oh, no. And, 
And when she was right there, I said, please, sister, let me just say this thing. Please, 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 I have to say it right now. I promise you, I promise you, honestly, that I will never say another word for the rest of my life. I will keep quiet always, but I have to say this right now. I have to say it now, 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 because I've, if I don't say it now, I'll explode. And sister was there like that, and she says, well, you just go and explode yourself outside. <laughs> um, I, 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 they were very understanding. There was never any abuse. There was never any anything that I regret about my being brought up by them. And so when I see them mocked, it really, it really offends me but in any case okay so there is this new film out mocking the eucharist and mo mocking none so mocking everything and i decided to go and see what this i i looked it up who what was this film what was that i know that i'm going to go and see it but and uh, it seems that um, the protagonist is a a, a young lady um who is a singer her name is Rihanna or Rihanna or something like that anyway so I was just checking what the film was about and there is a picture of her there and um, um, obviously a pop singer I believe she is and uh, not that I want to pound on her because I mean she's she's just um, a pop singer wanting to be relevant and on the news or whatever but that picture of her was was there and she she had she was practically um almost naked really her, her clothes were so so tight that um the clothes that she was wearing constrained her so much that it seemed rather than she was their prisoner than their own. <laughs> it was no. It's true. It's, it's a. It's a. If you scratched her, you would probably break your nail. Anyway, uh, I didn't want to. It's. It's. It's just one of those things about nuns. But why this obsession with nuns all the time? I find it. I don't want to argue against it from a moral point of view even it's just that it's so utterly vulgar uh, it's the vulgarity of it all why would you mock someone's religion why would you feel so free to go after sacred things that other people considered sacred and actually mock them what is it they 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 don't seem to give up i mean if they feel that contempt for christianity why don't they just ignore us i mean isn't that what you do when you think that something is silly superstitious whatever just leave it alone but no they keep coming back to attack it why that obsession i was wondering so on this point of uh vulgarity um, <clears throat> there is a, a very nice little line here by Lord Chesterfield in his letters to his son. I think I quoted from him uh, a time back. So, uh, but uh, this is about uh, vulgarity and um, on the question of religion and morals, he's writing to his son. Uh, saying never to do that, never to uh, mock or never to show any contempt at all for religion or morals. It's, and he, he's not, uh, his argument is not from a, from an ethical or a moral point of view. He's trying to make a gentleman of him and it would be terribly vulgar, he explains. To, to do this and he says um, uh, 
where is it? Um, conf uh, I, I shall confine myself in this letter uh, to um, to argue. Oh, I understand that using reason, giving reasons, won't suffice. One cannot fight this with evidence to the contrary. Okay, so um, he says, um, a society has a need for morals and confines himself to not arguing against it from, from a religious, as I said, or a moral point of view, but to actually uh, confines himself to the decency and the utility and the necessity of scrupulously, he says, persevering on the appearance, he emphasized appearance, of both, um, of, of keeping religion and morals. This is against vulgarity of doing the contrary. He says, when I say the appearances of religion, I do not mean that you should talk or act like a missionary or an enthusiast, nor that you should take up a controversial cudgel against whoever uh, denomination uh, you are uh, you are of. This would be both useless and unbecoming. But I mean that you should by no means seem to approve, encourage or applaud those libertine progressive notions which strike at religious uh, religions equally and which are the poor threadbare topics of half-wits and minute philosophers. Even those who are silly enough to laugh at their jokes are still wise enough to distrust and detest their characters for putting moral virtues at the highest and religion at the lowest, religion might still be allowed to be a collateral security, at least to virtue, and every prudent man will sooner trust to two securities than to one. Whenever, therefore, you happen to be in the company with those who pretend to be progressives or esprit fort, um, or with the tough, uh, toughless libertines who laugh at all religions in order to show their wit or disclaim it to complete their riot. Let no word or look of yours intimate the least approbation, but enter not into the subject and decline such unprofitable and indecent controversies. Depend upon this truth, that every man, man is the worse looked upon and the less trusted for being thought to have no religion. In spite of all the pompous and specious epitaphs he may assume of progressive or free thinker or moral philosopher, and a wise atheist, if such a thing there is, would, for his own interest and character in this world, pretend to some religion. Your moral character must be not only pure, but like Caesar's wife, unsuspected. The least speck or blemish upon it is fatal. Nothing degrades and vilifies more for it excites and unites detestation and contempt. There are, however, wretches in the world profligate enough to explode all notions of moral good and evil, to maintain that they are merely local and depend entirely upon the customs and fashions of different countries. Nay, there are still, if possible, more unaccountable wretches. I mean, those who affect to preach and propagate such absurd and infamous notions without believing them themselves. These are the devil hypocrites. Avoid as much as possible the company of such people who reflect a degree of discredit and infamy upon all who converse with them. But as you may sometimes by accident fall into such company, 
those who mocked religion he's talking about, right? Um, as you may sometimes by accident fall into such company, take great care that no complacence, no good humor, no warmth of festal mirth ever make you seem even to acquiesce, much less to approve or applaud such infamous doctrines. On the other hand, do not debate nor enter into serious argument upon a subject so much below it but content yourself with telling those apostles that you know they are not serious that you have a much better opinion of them than they would have you have you have and that you are very sure they would not practice the doctrine they preach but put your private mark upon them and shun them forever afterwards there is nothing so delicate as moral character and nothing which it is your interest so much to preserve pure should you be suspected of injustice malignity perfidy lying etc all the parts and knowledge in the world will never procure your esteem friendship or respect a strange concurrence of circumstances has sometimes raised very bad men to high stations but they have been raised like criminals to a pillory where their persons and their crimes by being more conspicuous are only the more known the more detested and the more pelted and insulted that's lord chesterfield saying that it is bad manners really and rather vulgar to attack religion uh, let me just hold on. okay so so this is uh, lord chesterfield advising his son to actually show contempt for those who would uh, mock religion and morals so that is one way but what happens when the attack is so grave and so uh, continuous all the time that you can contempt seems to be insufficient um, should we then confront it and uh, when when an individual or a, or a movement or an organization uh, behaves in in an abusive and and uh, counterproductive or dangerous way we should do something about it and obviously without uh, recourse to anger perhaps try to prevent the jerk <laughs> from from doing harm but uh, this is not what happens uh, why not because the weakness and the moral inadequacy of these idiots because we we have now moved on from vulgarity to idiocy um, the the moral inadequacy of these idiots um, do not actually say everything about idiocy you see idiocy is, is not just weakness it is also ugliness it is the repulsive face of human weakness uh, so an idiot gets on on your nerves makes you sick but so if you decide to withdraw the more he insults you so in that case you retreat further going ever deeper into uh, a quack, a quackmire as, uh, as it were of your own uh, contempt um, how can you not detest this other person but you see the more you hate the deeper you sink so um, shall we then confront them uh, face to face uh, this is something that we have to those of us who feel strongly about religion and morals and actually defending our own religion have to decide 
because they're going to continue doing this which which one which attitude do you think is more relevant to continuously ignore it or to confront it head on and how if we do that that is what I'm thinking about right now okay I hope you also think about it a little bit thank you so much for listening bye bye